Emily Goodwin here with Writers of the Future. We're talking with friends around the world. Special guest today, Eric Schimmel. Eric, welcome. Pleased to meet you. Great to meet you. All right, so I found out a little bit about you before the uh, interview. You sound like a fascinating person. You have all kinds of things going on in your life. So uh, please share. Um, 53. I have a degree in philosophy. I teach Pilates for a living. I am born and sworn to science fiction since before, before, and I'm a lifetime dilettante martial arts geek. I've got lots of black belts and I've been to lots of cool places and I've been lucky to travel a bunch. Fantastic. And, um, so tell me who are some of your favorite science fiction fantasy authors? I, uh, this is the right time to say this. <laughs> I've had this book since the ninth grade. Can you see what that says? Yes. I think that's the first ever publication of Ender's Game. I'm not sure. Look at the gentleman. Oh, old school. Okay. Look at him. <laughs> you must so have. That, that should give you a sense. Um, I'm a huge Larry Niven person. My father raised me on Heinlein. I think I can honestly say I've read 70% of what Heinlein has written. I have never met someone who claims they've read it all. <laughs> Amazing. Wow, that's great. And how did you hear about the writers of the future? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to get an agent for the novels that I'm writing. And I've been at it a while. And one of the smart things you should do is try to get a short story published. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a short story. And the day I finished it, my friend said, do you know about Writers of the Future? I didn't. So he said, oh, you should do this. And I, 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 I like to research stuff. So I researched the contest and its history a bunch and got that major feeling of greed. Like, I want to be part of this. I want, I want some of this. And so I kind of dedicated to my, myself to it. Uh, I have four entries planned. And as soon as I, I'm going to spend the year working on this project. <laughs> So I, that's how I like to do stuff. I went back to the, you know, the people that run the contest, the people that judge the contest say, so this is what we're looking for. This is how we like it. And these are some examples of people who've won in the past. You should study this. Mm -hmm. I immediately downloaded the workshop uh, and ran my first story through it. It was already written, but the workshop was all, a really great template for laying out stories. And so I sort of reconfigured my first story according to the workshop and have built, a, all workshops are valuable. They're what you put into them. Yeah. And this was a very easy one to choose to dedicate myself to. So I've, it sounds goofy, but I've spent the, the last five months writing stories exclusively through the format of the workshop as it's laid out. Wow. Um, uh, the, so the first one before it was submitted was reconfigured. I can't really say I wrote that one through the workshop, mm -hmm. but I, I moved it through that machine. And then the other two were written from that basis. Uh, and then I got two more I got to write, a fourth story and then a capper to make it a book. That's great. I'm so glad that you found it. I, 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 I want to stress both things. You get out of workshops, what you put into them, none of them are magic. And... Boy, this was a really good one. I, I mean, you heard I've been at this for a while. I, I, I teach Pilates and I do martial arts. I go through seminars like an earthworm through dirt I re in, in my entire adult life. And so this, this was just a really good one. It was nice to stop and, and like take this one very seriously. That's great. So yeah, so on, so officially it's called the L. Ron Hubbard Writers of the Future online workshop. It's free for anybody to take. Uh, I was definitely surprised we put that we put that up uh, shortly after the lockdowns happened, and uh, we were expecting or we were hoping that we would have maybe 500 people uh, take the course through the end of the year. You know that was like our like that would be great, and uh, within 24 hours we had a thousand people sign up, and wow. you know, it's just it just like. I know it just keeps going in over 55 countries. So it's been amazing. Uh, I'm so glad that people are taking advantage of it because, you know, we have three of our top dogs on there. We have David Farlin, Orson Scott Card, and Tim Powers teaching and uh, yeah. really like a one on one. So, what was that like having that one on one with those uh, giants? It was, it was, it was terrific. I mean, those are names I grew up with and names I care about. I, I want to say, I wouldn't have mentioned it if you hadn't have mentioned it. 
the workshop is essentially how I have spent my quarantine. They came, they, they started together and that's kind of all I've done the last five months. I just went back to work a few days ago. I spent my quarantine with y'all. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so nice to hear. Well, I'm sure a little bit of that and a little bit of your martial arts as well. <laughs> yeah, let's go with yes. <laughs> so uh, it was it was really great to hear Orson Scott Card speak. I've read so much of his work. I've been listening to, I've been around him in a sense for so long. All three of everyone who spoke, I hate to say this this way, you could tell they prepared. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I go to a lot of seminars. You pay, and I didn't even, this was free, but you pay your money and the person gets up there and they go, uh, that's painful. Yeah. All of these people had something intelligent they wanted to say and they were good at saying it. I don't, I, that's a fake phrase I realized, but not if you go to a lot of seminars, it's not. This was well done. Um, so you could see, there was like, they were very strong speakers. So it wasn't, a tr it wasn't difficult to sit and watch them. Yeah. You know, I, I, you can picture, I was like, I'm going to do this. And I buckled down very hard. I, I call it Muppet Labs when I lock myself in my room and nobody goes in or out and I'm just going to work. Yeah. Uh, and so I initiated Muppet Labs and I started the workshop. It was fun. I was laughing. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, I mean, but, all three of them, that's, they, they love to teach. They love to lend a helping hand. They love helping new authors. So for them, this is nothing new. I mean, they've delivered so many workshops, um, you know, every year when people win the Rise of Future contest, uh, they come out to Los Angeles and teach the workshop there. So this is, uh, and they were just as excited to be able to share this broadly. So, you know, we're very happy about it. Excellent. My favorite video is definitely a thousand one stories out of a hat mm -hmm. because it was like sitting around with your friends, just trying to come up with stuff for fun. Like you're all yelling out. Ideas. It had that feel. Yeah. And Orson uh, Scott Card has a sense of humor, obviously, which comes through in the video. I cracked up when he said, I invented laser tag, didn't even get credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so there were 10 essays on the course from L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, how did those go for you? And was there any particularly that stood out for you? There were two in particular I wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I want to say something even weirder before that. I'm a, I'm a language guy. I love Shakespeare for the influence he has on our language now. I love Benjamin Franklin. I'm a Franklin American. Uh, I love Benjamin Franklin for the effect he has on even now modern language. Holy gosh. I haven't been exposed to any L. Ron Hubbard other than Battlefield Earth when I was a child. Like, basically none. And all these things he wrote about writing in the late 30s, early 40s, I think that's like the wellspring of American speech of the period. I think that's where like the Bowery Boys and the folks in the background of Abbott Costello, I think the way we talked to prove we were smart and cool, which is always really important, I think that L. Ron Hubbard is one of the posts of American vernacular, if that's not too wacky. Mm -hmm. I was cracking up reading those essays. They were dynamite. That's great. And then you uh, mentioned that there were two that stood out for you. What were those? So my two favorite essays, Magic Out of a Hat. Oh, yeah. uh, that's a particular thing. Yeah, uh, uh, not, not to be too familiar, but folks like us really don't mind stories about stories. And that's a story about a story about a story. Yeah. I love stuff like that. <laughs> but, you know, it was like Inception in reverse. Like, I enjoyed the heck out of it. Yeah. Uh, so that was just a bunch of fun, you know. It made me want to come up with ideas. Yeah, and that uh, and whole backstory with him and Arthur Burks. Yeah, yeah, you know, were, were you not in all of those rooms? And every time you stopped in one of those rooms, you had something you wanted to add? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I called friends. If, if I read anything that just lights me up, especially if it relates to history, I call friends. And so I was calling friends left and right while I was reading the L. Ron Hubbard essays. The, that's just how we used to talk. Yeah. I, think, I, I think he was the source of it. I do. Wow. Uh, so I have a big theater background. Uh, I don't act anymore, but I was once. Uh, art, more about oh, yeah. that essay. And I, anybody would have to look at their notes. It's essentially an attempt to boil the art of writing down to an effective definition, mm -hmm. which is impossible. Um, and 
any art form, I come from acting, right? And the, the logic of sufficient, I'm not gonna get this exactly right, forgive me, but sufficient technical skill to produce an emotional impact, that's art. That's, the, that's where order, parameters, chaos, and art is produced. And if you're on stage as an actor, you gotta be really careful about that line. You can't uh, actually be it. That's not really acting and it's a poor performance. And the, the state you have to be in in writing, I feel I feel I'm being really fluffy, but that idea that your craft has to be sharpened to the point where not you can feel it, it's not about you. When your craft is sharpened to the point where it can produce any emotional effect from you in the, in the reader or the receiver, that is the definition of art. Yeah. It's as good a definition of art as anybody has ever done in the universe, I figure. <laughs> yeah. I, I get a lot of uh, response from that particular essay. I mean, it's, it's hmm. incredible. Oh, yeah, I, I enjoyed that a lot. Awesome. So who would you recommend this uh, free online workshop to? <laughs> I have pushed this on a lot of people. Um, you know how it is. If, if you choose to dive into something... Well, then you see all the good in it. You want all your friends to see it too. Sure. So I, I probably have six or seven friends, three of whom are artists and four of whom are writers who I have aggressively shoved toward doing this program. Because, uh, you know, I'll spend a bunch of hours on it one day and then what are you going to do with the rest of your day? Call your friends and go, oh, you should be like me. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody who... Huh, because I, I feel weird telling other people how to learn to write. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you pick things to study. We could toss books back and forth that we like about the craft of writing. If whatever stage you're at, if you've got something that you love, if that, that, that's the right answer. If you have a story that you love and you, want, and you don't want to get like beaten up and brutalized uh, in getting advice for this story... I, especially with my first one, I found going to the workshop with a story I already was, you know, in love with. I loved it. But looking at the, the workshop was a really nice way to get, to get criticism for my work that wasn't mean. You know, it can be hard being a new writer. Sure. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was a really good place to take my shiny new story that I was in love with. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know run it through a couple of different mills and take some edges off and understand how it might look to somebody who wasn't already in love with it. Yeah. It was a good perspective because I come, I didn't say this enough when I was talking about the seminar before, if you've been to any writing seminars and I'm not blaming anybody for this, but they can, they can be a tad unapproachable. Mm. Uh, and this was extremely approachable. It was comforting. Nobody, there was, I'm struggling for how to say this because these were all seriously accomplished writers who had nothing to prove. They spoke from the heart and they didn't ever speak down to you. You walk into a room with someone and know they're going to speak down to you. None of these people were like that. They were really happy to be there. So it was just a comforting place to examine my own work. Nice. That's great. That's very nice to hear. Yeah, I mean, they they really care. I mean, that's why they're part of the Writers of the Future contest is because that was, that's the whole, that's everything about the contest is it's a pay it forward and lending a helping hand and they spend their time to help new authors and uh, it's, it's super nice. I mean, that's how when L. Ron Hubbard started this contest back in the 80s, that was the intention was to lend a helping hand, to pay it forward and also to create that level playing field uh, because, you know, there's other contests that you can enter, or other awards that you can enter, but you're up against these very people that are teaching you, and that's mm. not exactly fair. They might have a little edge up. So, <laughs> um, so that's, that's something that's, uh, you know, a benefit of this and of the contest. So, so it's great. I'm glad that you got to take that. And um, you also read some of the Writers of the Future anthologies too, right? Uh, I read... Every single bit of 36 as part of my prep that, that I considered that to be part of the workshop. I mean, it, no one said you got to read 36, but everybody said, look, this is what we like. Why don't you read that? Uh, so reading 36 was, was part of my prep. Uh, and I, it was, it was, it was fun. It's, uh, I haven't read a collection of short stories since I was in my thirties. Wow. 
Um, I was out of the habit because science fiction short stories, they're like the greatest thing in the world. Nothing else can do what a sci-fi short story can do, right? They're the new mythology. I could go on. I'm a most kind of guy, you know? Yeah. So that was my thing for a bunch of years. I haven't read a, a short story collection until the 36th anthology. Nice. Uh, it was really rewarding. And, and any stories stick out or did you have a favorite? There, there are three stories that I really want to shout out to. Mm -hmm. um, Foundations by Michael Gardner was my visceral favorite. The one about the young girl whose relationship with her house and yeah. her family are intertwined. That was haunting. Yeah. It stuck with me after I was done with it. I want to say a story upset me a little bit. Like it was hard to pull myself out of it when it was over. That was a gut punch kind of story. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, educational tapes by Katie Livingston. Yeah. I, 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 again, I'm the sort of person that yells at the television. I yelled at my iPad while reading that story. She broke a lot of rules. Talk yeah. about keeping the question alive to the bitter end. Mm -hmm. the, also, there's that L. Ron Hubbard story that keeps the question alive to the bitter end with the oh, angels. Yes. But that's like, that was some high art. It yeah. was the opposite of accessible. It was super hard to read. You had to lean into it. And I was like exhausted when I finished that story. It was just, I wanted to... I wanted to buy that woman a beer when I finished reading her story. Just like, I wanted to slap her on the back and go, can I hang out with you? That was cool. And that was the longest story in the book, I believe. Was it? Yeah. I, honestly, what you just said surprises me. I, I, I didn't even remember it that way. I remember tearing through it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, and then um, Catherine Kirk's The Green Tower. Oh, yeah. That story is like a little master class on how to extrapolate a smaller story out of a larger pre-existing story. Yeah. That was, she invented two characters that allowed for a framework for you to see her entire thing. Like everything she built as viewed casually through these two people whose relationship I was totally caught up in. And when it was over, I needed to know what was going on in the whole world. You know, yeah. like that was how, that's, that was, I studied myself studying that story. That was really cool. <laughs> Awesome. And then uh, do you yourself have a website or somewhere where someone can find out more about you? I have a website dedicated to my professional work, Pilates and martial arts, but nothing about my writing yet. Uh, I'd love for people to check out the website, check out my philosophy on martial arts and, and longevity, Pilates.com with a Z, P-I-L-A-T-E-Z.com. There's right. no way I could have gotten the one with the S. Yeah. But I own Pilates.com with a Z. <laughs> okay, great. And uh, what kind of martial arts do you do? Oh, I'm the worst. <laughs> I am a terrible dilettante. Um, I mean, big shout out to Japanese goju, which is something I, I'm lucky to have gotten an exposure to. But my dad took me to see Enter the Dragon when it came oh. out in 1973. Um, that was, so it was over all, after that? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been about Chinese Kung Fu pretty much my whole life. Chinese Kung Fu is like my mom. Um, and all the, everything I enjoy about life comes to me through that. And then for the last 10 years, well, even more than that, uh, I, I, I have a Philippine partner. I have been to the Philippines about eight times and I've been studying Philippine Kali for the last decade. Uh, this is a Gununting carved out of Camagon. It's a protected wood that I got from the craftsman who's allowed to take, take it out of the woods. Wow. <laughs> this is a barong. <laughs> the famous Philippine weapon that their soldiers carry. And that's a Taliban. Wow, what a collection. <laughs> so uh, the, I suppose the straight answer to your question is mostly Chinese Kung Fu, but I've been studying the Philippine arts for a decade. Wow. Very lucky with that. And, if, and all, is all that on your website, all that neat stuff? Yes, with, with perhaps a little more sense of humor. I, awesome. Uh, I have one more thing you might like to see. It'll take a minute, and, and uh, you know, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, sure. About three, about a minute from here, I have a nine-month-old, 90-pound Rhodesian Ridgeback puppy. Do you want to see the gigantic puppy? Yes, please. I got, he's downstairs. I'll be, I'll be. Okay, I'm, I'll wait. <laughs> Oh! <laughs>
<laughs> oh my! <laughs> Hello, puppy. What's his name? His name is Diwa, which means fire spirit. He's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Wow. And uh, and he's a handful. <laughs> yes. Oh, what a sweet puppy! Thank you for bringing him on. Oh, obviously, it's a pleasure. We love this dog. Awesome. All right. Well, Eric, we're going to wrap up here, but. Eric, it's been great speaking to you. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, very interesting things you have to say. I'm glad that you found the, the contest. I'm glad that you found the workshop, and I, I hope that it's helped you, and, um, and best of luck with your submissions and your stories that you're putting out there. Thank you.